His love is so good. Anyway, I gotta say good morning again, and I'm gonna say good morning to all those that'll be joining us online. Uh, this morning we're gonna be continuing our study in uh, in uh, James, uh, the book of James, and and in just a moment we're gonna be picking up where we left off last week. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me if you will to James chapter two. We're in James chapter two. We're gonna begin. We're gonna we're gonna back up two verses to verse eight. Uh, for part two in this message that we began last week. And that is the message that deals with favoritism and partiality. But before we do that, nothing good happens without prayer. That's right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for all who are here. Now, it's good to see Rick here after after last week's mishap with breaking his wrist. And it's good to see him here. And so we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, Lord, we just we just pray that, that you would be with every part of this message, uh, that you would um, that you would just uh, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to truly hear from from you this morning as as we go through this message that James has written for the early church and for us. So, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for that. And and we ask you, Lord, to uh, to just help this vessel, that you would speak through me, that it be your words and not mine. Uh, and, Lord, we just we just want to give you glory for all that you do today. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right, now, our text this morning continues to address the issue that we that we all have encountered at one time or another uh, in our lives, and that is the issue of favoritism and partiality. Everybody, everybody has been partial that's in this room, and everybody has seen partiality uh, in this room. Uh, and you know, because we tend to part, we tend to categorize people as being either higher than us or lower than us, don't we? I mean, we just categorize them. You know what the Oxford Dictionary defines favoritism as this. The practice of giving an, giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or group at the expense of another, or showing of special favor, partiality. Uh, in other words, oh, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you knew I was going to go dry, didn't you? I left it down there. Thank you. Uh, so, in other words, showing partiality is treating one person better than another person for whatever reason. And there's no room for that, James says, in the church. There's no room for that in, in Christian life. And we're told that there's no valid, compelling reason for this type of treatment, especially in profession professing Christians are the ones that are showing partiality. Um, people with the same needs, they, you know, they need, they deserve to be treated the same. And people, we all have the same needs, don't we? Now, now we often show favoritism and partiality based on things like somebody's appearance, or maybe the, the clothes that they wear, uh, for their profession, maybe possessions, Sometimes it's their lifestyle, education, uh, what kind of money they have, or if they have it or they don't have it, their position in life, or fame and fortune, right? We tend, to, we tend to be more gracious, we tend to be more kind and forgiving and loving to somebody who is similar to us uh, in, in that perspective. You would probably agree with me, right? Uh, which, is, which is actually favoritism, according to the dictionary definition, and according to, to the Bible, according to James and God's definition, it is, it is, it is actually a sin to be being partial or having favorites. Uh, so, I mean, you're my favorites. I already said that last week. You're my favorites. But, but that's not a sinful sort of favoritism, right? I just prefer you guys because you guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you are. James 2.9 says, But if any of you shows partiality, you're committing what? Sin. Uh, and, we, and are con, uh, convicted by the law as transgressors. So without a doubt, James is saying 
Uh, God says this kind of behavior is an undeniable sin. You can't deny it. It is an undeniable sin. Now, because all of this goes together, just let me remind you what James said last time. Because uh, we saw that partiality was totally unacceptable. The first thing we saw, it's unacceptable in the body of Christ in the church. And that's because partiality violates God's second commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. It violates that. And James says that breaking God's law is sin. Uh, and breaking any part of it is breaking the whole law. So James also says that God's law is going to be the standard by which everybody's going to be judged. So we ought to live in the light of that coming judgment, especially by showing mercy and grace to the poor. Look at the first verse. <clears throat> he says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He says, show no partiality, plain and simple. Do you see that? And then in the next verse, he describes how favoritism and partiality was a problem in the church. James gave them a practical example of that verse too. He says, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into, the assembly, into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, uh, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say um, to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Um, he's, you're, you're, you're showing preference then. And, then. and then after he contrasted that with those, we, we went ahead and we contrasted those two men and we, we saw the Lord's position on this problem. And James warned us about the wickedness of showing favoritism and partiality to others, in the, especially in the church. Uh, so James made that real clear in verse 4 that this isn't an acceptable response, and he explained why. In verse 4 he says, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, well then we consider the position of the poor. Uh, uh, and look at verse 5. Uh, what did we discover when we looked at the closer at the treatment of the poor? We realized that the, the church's attitude was opposite to what God's attitude is. They had dis disrespected the poor uh, by their actions. And James says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in, the faith, in, in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who, who love him? So the Lord said three things about the poor, people, poor folks that were coming to the church. He spoke about their position before God. First of all, he says they are God's chosen ones. They're chosen by God. You see, God loves the poor. God loves the common people, and he protects them, and, and, and they are chosen by God. And secondly, we learn that they are rich in faith. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? That's what the verse, fifth verse says. You see, an affluent person, uh, man or woman, doesn't matter, tends to trust in their resources, in their money. But a poor man has to trust in the Lord. Uh, as a result, there's a natural inclination uh, toward faith among those who are poor. And then the third thing that he said about, about the position of the poor was that they were also heirs of the kingdom, which, has, which he has promised to those who love him. In other words, James was saying, don't automatically discriminate against the poor, uh, for they are the ones who will most likely respond to the gospel and become heirs of the kingdom. Then James also encouraged uh, them and us to take a closer look at the rich. And, and what did we discover when we looked at the rich? We discovered that the rich were actually the cause of the problem, a lot of the problems that were happening in the early church. So he discussed the oppression of the prosperous, by the prosperous. If you look at verses six and seven now, it says, but you have dishonored the poor man and are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now, in this passage, James is referring to the wealthy ruling class who was persecuting the church. 
and they he did persecute the early church and they did they did it um, in to a wide extent so he's saying that the wealthy and the rich often despised the gospel also the true gospel because it challenged three things and we looked at those last time it challenged their position it challenged their finances and it challenged their pride uh, so he says that no one should be elevated above another person uh, no one should be elevated so uh, do not disparage the poor he says don't disparage them don't belittle the wealthy either uh, so James in essence was saying don't pander to the rich because they're they're actually the ones that are going to be persecuting the church and then we began to look at the test of partiality which is the principles for proper practice that are given to us in verses 8 and 9 and this is where we're going to pick up on our text this morning uh, so, so now that you have the background uh, if you weren't here uh, it says if if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself you are doing well you see that you're doing well but if you show partiality you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors he doesn't he doesn't mince his words James is very straightforward, and he is, he's, he's, I'm sure he was the life of the party. <laughs> James seems to be anticipating what his, what his readers are going are gonna to say in response to verse 8, and James says, it's okay, you know, if you, if you, if you say that you're fill, fulfilling God's law of love, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well, you're, you just keep it up, keep up that good work. Uh, the point is, is once we understand this law, it becomes the supreme law governing all of our human relationships in the church and outside the church. The first of those great laws was mentioned by the Lord in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, where he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, which addresses the first half of the Ten Commandments pertaining to God. If I love him with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, if I, if I, if I love him like that, I, I, I will have no trouble loving others like he loves others. And that's what distinguishes believers. That's what distinguishes believers from non-believers. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our love is what makes us unique. We are unique that way. And according to James, if you do that, if you show that everyone is equal in love and that the needs are being met regardless of who they are, then you're doing well. And, and you're fulfilling God's sovereign, supreme law of love. Now that word well, in the original language, actually has a connotation towards very well or extremely well. You're doing extremely well if you follow this law. This is, this is the will of God. And His glory is consistent with this, with this statement. You are doing a great job, uh, and this is consistent with His Son, His Word, bearing His name and believing in Him. All of that, you're doing a great job. Uh, a Christian does well when he fulfills the law of love. When you guys are loving on each other in the morning before the service starts, you're fulfilling that law. They, and, and there were people doing this, and they were doing it well in the congregation that James was writing to. And that's wonderful to know, because we've got an example that we can look at. But according to verse 9, there were some other people that were doing just the opposite. As, as his congregation uh, was probably patting themselves on the back, thinking they were doing a good job, James hits them with this reality that and he says, but if, I show, if, if you show partiality, you're committing sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, some of you, he claims, are not following this supreme law of love. And you, you've shown partiality, and this is not an isolated incident. This is something that you continue to do. You're, it's a constant practice for you. You continue to show favoritism, um, and, and you are committing 
sin. You are violating God's law. And as a result, he says that you've been found guilty of transgressing the law. The law says don't do it, and you're doing it. So the law is your is the thing that convicts you, and the, ev the evidence that we see around that uh, proves that you're guilty. On the one hand, when you love everyone equally, you show no partiality and favoritism. You fulfill God's word and the supreme law, and you're doing extremely well. On the other hand, when there is a habitual favoritism and partiality, you're breaking the law, the law that God forbids, he forbids partiality. And James is saying that if you do it, you transgress the law, and you're a transgressor. Now, to transgress is to willfully cross the boundary, to transgress the boundary, which means to go beyond the limits. It's like going to a sign that says, do not enter. You read the sign and it says under penalty, right? And you read that sign and you say, I'm going in anyway. That's transgression. Sin is simply falling short of God's perfect standard, but transgression is going beyond the law of God. And James says, you're a transgressor of the law. And by the, by the way, this is, a, this is a characterization that he's making here. If you show partiality, you're violating God's law. You're characteristically now considered a sinner, a transgressor, and a violator of God's law. On, on, and on any level, that is a serious, serious matter. And that's our second point. Because violating God's law is a serious matter. So let's follow James' reasoning to confirm the seriousness of this sin uh, and its devastating nature, its extent, and how it violates God's law. This is really significant. This is a significant passage. If, if, if you have a problem with partiality and you have a problem with favoritism, you need to pay it close attention close attention today because this is this is as valid today as it was back then this is really significant and this is such a serious issue for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all how many laws do you have to break to be considered a lawbreaker one one how many laws must you break to become a, 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 a lawbreaker? One. How many sins do you have to commit to be classified as a sinner? One. The unity of God's law, you see, is that it all fits together. We have an obligation to follow all of God's law. To break the law at one point is to become a lawbreaker because you're defying God's authority and His Word. And, and you're denying God's full love and devotion, saying that you won't love Him uh, with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength in that area. It's just like saying, I'm not going to love you like that. I'm not going to do that. You, I, you, you're, I'm not going to submit to you in that area. I won't obey you in that area. Uh, I'm going to violate you in that area. So you're, you're a lawbreaker if, the, if that's the case. Despite breaking only a small, small part, just a tiny part of the law, you're labeled as a sinner and a transgressor because you have shown a heart of rebellion towards God's law. Matthew 5, 19 says, Whoever therefore breaks at least uh, one of the least of these commandments and, and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, uh, whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You, Jesus is saying, if you just break one law, you're a violator. In other words, the law is a co cohesive unit. It's a cohesive unit. It's similar to a chain. If you if you have a chain, uh, it's only as strong as its weakest link, right? And if you break a link in that chain, it's a broken chain. 
No matter how you look at it, it's broken. Likewise, if you were to take a mirror or a piece of glass and you, there's a crack in it, it may not be broken all the way through, but it's still a broken window or a broken mirror. It means it's broken because it has a crack. This verse along with verse 11 puts things in proper perspective. They demonstrate that it's impossible to achieve justification through the law. We cannot live a good enough life to merit God's righteousness. If we stumble and fall in area, any area of God's law, we are, we are in violation of the entire law. This, this is absolute. There's no exceptions. I'm amazed that people can read this passage and still believe in a works-based salvation. I just, it, it amazes me. Uh, we, we recognize that we will not be judged on the basis of, of, of the opinions of men or the opinions of, of the world. You, 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 you may live better than everyone else. You mean everybody else in your life. You could be living better than any of them. And, and that is not enough. We, we, we will be judged on God's holy standard of absolute perfection. There's nothing else that we're going to be judged by. And apart from Christ, no one can achieve that perfection. You want to try and get there on your own? Good luck. Nobody's ever been able to do it. So Jesus is the answer. Look again at verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. And then he illustrates it by saying, For he who said, Do not commit, murder, commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit, if you if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Not only part of the law, all of the law. We would be wrong to conclude that from this, all of the law's commands are equally important. You realize these two, these two that he said, adultery and murder, were death penalty uh, offenses. Death penalty. So we'd be wrong to conclude that all of the law's commands are equally important or that all sins are the same. They're not. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have, ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus is saying that the weightier provisions of the law are justice and mercy and faithfulness, implying that other issues such as tithing table spices uh, are less important. The Apostle Paul, he also said that sexual sins are worse than other sins. When he wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, he said, flee. He said, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. Uh, but the, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So sexual immorality is worse is a worse sin than mentally lusting. Murdering someone is worse than being angry at somebody mentally. Uh, but James' point is really whatever the sin is, it makes you a lawbreaker. We're all lawbreakers. All have sinned. You see, uh, you, you can be a good person in all other ways, but if you violate the law, you're a lawbreaker. For example, if a man's found guilty of murder, let's say he's on trial and he's found guilty of murder, it makes no difference whether he's been a faithful husband, a good father, that he's never received uh, a citation of any sorts, uh, he's never robbed a bank. He's never beaten up someone in public or, or has messed with his neighbor. And all of that, all that, all that matters is whether or not he committed murder, right? If so, he broke the law. So you might say, well, my life isn't too bad. You know, I'm sitting here listening to you. I'm not too bad. I'm actually a good person. And... It's probably true, but you're still guilty. You're still guilty. Everybody's guilty. Have you ever lied? You're guilty. Have you ever wanted something that others, somebody else had? You're guilty. Have you ever been selfish, failing to consider the needs of others as much as your own needs? You're guilty. You see, 
you, 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 don't, you don't have to murder or you don't have to be an adulterer to be guilty of breaking the law. You're guilty of all of this. You're, you're guilty of all sins, whether you commit one or more. Romans 3.23 says, We are all sinners, period. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've sinned. I'm going to go out and stick my neck out. We've all sinned today. Every single one of us. Uh, no one is righteous. And as God looks at every person who's ever lived, he sees those who have broken his law. And, and the only cure for that sin is salvation in Christ. Galatians 3.10 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. You see that? And do them. If you're unable, so if you're unable to obey every law according to God's holy standards, you're guilty of all of them, and thank goodness Jesus died on the cross so that you could be forgiven of them. So he's really putting them in a difficult situation, as you can see. If you, if you show favoritism, verse 1 states that you are completely inconsistent with a Christian walk with God. You're completely inconsistent. He warns against showing favoritism, and it obviously was a problem. You're contradicting what God has done in choosing the poor of the world, whom, whom you may even despise but he, he chose them to populate his kingdom. You're inconsistent with the fact that the rich have always oppressed the poor. Why would you identify with them? Why would you want to? And if you're, if you're partial or you're showing favoritism, you have violated scripture by violating the supreme sovereign law that God says that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And we're good at loving ourselves. We are. We've got a PhD in that. And, 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 and if you've shown partiality, you've broken God's entire law, and you're condemned as a transgressor. There's no grace in the law. You know that, right? There is no grace in the law. There's only grace outside that law through Jesus Christ. That's where you find grace. But to get back to the point James is making, Showing partiality is a violation of God's law of love. This is a serious matter, James says, uh, because it makes you guilty before God. And that brings us to the third point that he's going to make, which is the certainty of a judgment. Certainty. There is a certainty of judgment. Look at verse 12, which is which it's a, really a call to be aware of the dangers of this certainty of divine judgment. It says, so speak and so act. Okay, I want you to just pay attention to that. In other words, so speak and act. In other words, you've got to get involved, involved in this. You've got to do this, right? Uh, as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. You're going to be judged as a Christian under the law of liberty. Now, that tells me there that there were true believers in this congregation who were who were following the supreme sovereign royal laws of that law that you'll love your neighbor as yourself. And then there were some in that church that were counterfeit Christians who were continually showing favoritism and violating God's law as transgressors and sinners. So he comes to, the, to point a finger directly at those transgressors. And he says, so speak you and do. In other words, you've got to do this continually as those who are judged under the law of liberty. Now, we must speak and act consistently as, as believers. We must. Only through Christ can we, can we live a life that pleases Him and bears witness to our faith in Him. That's our only hope. We must speak and, and live in accordance with our own faith. It, it should be obvious to people when they see you, when they know you,
when you talk to people, uh, you know, it should be obvious to all that you're a believer. It should be obvious to them that you are a Christian without you even opening your mouth. People shouldn't have to wonder uh, or ask questions about you. We must give a consistent witness for Christ while genuinely enjoying our relationship with Him. And I do mean, it's not a legalistic thing. Enjoy your relationship with Christ and let it flow. Let people see Christ in you. You see, if we aren't true to our faith, how can we expect others to want what we have? If we don't act like it, how can we expect anybody to want what we have? Now, James makes two distinctions here. Okay, the first is that believers are going to be judged by the law of liberty. Some, some may wonder, I thought believers weren't going to be judged because Christ bore our judgment on the cross. What does it mean to be judged by the law of liberty? Well, Je Jesus said in John 5, 24, he said, truly, truly, I say to you. Remember what it means when he says truly, truly, or verily, verily? It's listen up, listen up and listen closely. I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but it has passed from death to life. And then in Romans 8, 1, the Apostle Paul states plainly that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's lots of other verses. I just pulled these two. But there's lots of similar verses that demonstrate that Christ took the punishment that we deserved, he took that for our sins. He died for our sins. If we if we have put our faith and our trust in him, we're not going to face God's eternal wrath at the final judgment, uh, at the great white throne judgment revealed in Revelation 20. So since we are in Christ, we have no need to fear that 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 terrible judgment, the great white throne judgment, but we do face a judgment, folks, as believers. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Uh, that word evil literally means worthless. It's worthless deeds that you have done. I mean, totally worthless. Bad is another way it's translated. Our sins were judged and they were removed from us through Christ's death on the cross. You got that? Okay. You know, he removed those. This reveals the certainty of our judgment. There will come a day when everybody is going to stand before the Lord in judgment. We will all and I think it's a personal thing. I think you're going to stand there right with Jesus and he's going to go through your life. The lost are going to stand at the great white throne judgment while the saved will stand before Christ's judgment seat, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Believers will not be judged for their sin, which has already been judged and it was already settled. It was already paid for on the cross. We will be judged based on what we have done or what we have not done for Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Paul says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, your foundation is Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, okay, that first half is the good stuff. That's the good things you've done for Christ. Wood, hay, and straw is, is, is maybe the stuff that we did in the flesh. Uh, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but as only through fire. Our lives as believers will be evaluated by the Lord at the heart level. See, he looks at the heart. He looks at your motives. He looks at why you're doing things. He looks... Uh, 
so you're going to be rewarded. But selfish actions are worthless in God's eyes, and they're going to be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. We need to ask ourselves before that day comes along, did we really follow God's will for our lives? Were we responsive to His moving in our lives? How, have we laid up treasures in heaven instead of the treasures that we have here on earth? Are there any good works that are going to actually follow us home? Will they survive God's judgment or will they be burned up in His holy gaze? So your life is going to be judged. And, and if God looks at your life and He sees that you, you, you've handled your trials and the temptations that you, and you did that in a godly manner, that you responded to the Word and that you did not exhibit favoritism as a, as a pattern of life, and, and those, those are the works that James has been saying demonstrates whether or not you really, your, your salvation is actually valid. And you realize that James has been doing this all along, just making sure that you're sure. He, want, he doesn't want anybody slipping through his fingers. He wants, in his congregation, he wants to make sure that everyone is sure of their salvation, that they're not skating along and, and, and just hoping. You, you know, see, you will all be judged on that, on the, on the validity of our faith. God will examine our life record. He'll look at yours, he'll look at mine. Because according to Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you know that God has a plan for you to be a blessing to this world? Do you know that? Do you know that God has a plan for you to be out there as a witness to your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers and all the people that you know? Every believer is created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has already ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, so you hear it, you got to do it, right? So the pattern of your life uh, is the good works that God is producing in you. It serves, that serves as evidence of your salvation. Because listen, redemption always leads to obedient living. We obviously have times we disobey, okay? I'll be the first one to raise my hand on that. Uh, but the overall pattern is that we want to do well for Christ. We want to be a good witness. We want to do good works. Living faith will be revealed by a living love. Living faith will be revealed by a living love. It will be manifested in godly behavior in your life. And in general, we're not going to show favoritism. We will not show it. Obedience to God's word is a liberating thing. It, we are free from the bonds of sin. And we are free to do what God wants us to do. Because we love doing things for him. And we love it because we're doing it from our heart. So everybody's going to be judged in the future. Just know that. He says... So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by God's word. You are your, we're all going to be judged by God's word. And keep that in mind in, in all that you say or do. It's a, good, it's a good way to go through life. Keep that in mind that I'm going to answer for what I'm saying right now. I'm going to answer for what I'm thinking right now. I'm going to answer for those things because one day you're going to be judged on the basis of that and it'll be either reward or loss of reward. Okay, secondly, he, then he sets about to contrast those who show mercy uh, with, with those who don't, right? He, he's, going to, he's going to contrast them. And then when he contrasts them, he's going to give them a strong warning. For judgment is without mercy. You hear that? Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's no mercy or grace in the law. I've already said that. The only way you're going to find mercy and grace is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Christ said. 
According to my understanding, the first part of this 13th verse refers to unbelievers, while the last part refers to the to believers. Now keep in mind, however, that unbelievers described here in this first part of the verse may even profess to know Christ, and they may be a faithful attender of church. However, their actions demonstrate that they really have a dead faith rather than a genuine saving faith as James is going to explain next week, right? So in other words, you show me a person who has no mercy, you show me a person who has no compassion, who shows favoritism and partiality on a regular basis with no, with disregard for anyone in need, and I'll show you a person who will have no mercy in judgment. No mercy. Without Christ, no mercy. Why? Because they're just not saved. If you can go through your life like that and continue on and continue on and continue on in that sin and, and uh, if you claim to know Christ and you don't show mercy to the poor, your profession of faith is empty and it's useless. You can profess all day long that you are you're a believer, but if it's not right here in your heart and you're not right with God, I can guarantee you it's not right with God. So you won't receive mercy when you stand before God. You just check out Matthew 18, uh, 30 or 23 through 35. And listen, you don't want to go there. You, know, you just don't want to be there. You don't want, to, you don't want that to happen. It's just like in the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 7. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall what? Receive mercy. Listen, mercy begets mercy. If you're not merciful, if you're not, if you're not loving, you're burning the bridge you got to walk across. That's the bridge you got to walk across. Don't burn that bridge. When you are filled with God's love, you're going to be merciful to others. In fact, the more the more righteous a person is, the more merciful they'll be. Uh, you know, where mercy is given, mercy is distributed freely. So, so you look at a person and you see if they're impartial and, and, and they don't show favoritism and they're merciful, merciful to people in need, regardless of who they are. And they love others and, and as, as they would love themselves. And I'll show you a person whose life, uh, whose life God has poured him into him, into their life. He, God has poured his mercy, his love, and it's coming out. Is flowing through. And that's what God wants for every believer, is that whatever he put in is going to flow out. So he concludes this with verse 13. He says, mercy triumphs over just judgment. Now what does he mean by that? If your life is marked by mercy, you will triumph over the judgment. You, you will avoid judgment because being merciful demonstrates that your life has been transformed by Christ. That's the point he's trying to make. So if you're merciful without partiality, meeting people at their point of need, regardless of who they are, you demonstrate that you have received that mercy from Christ. And you have been transformed by the power of God, making you ready for the day of judgment. And, and you, you will triumph on that day by demonstrating the new life that, that Christ has given you through the attitude and action of mercy that has been shown to others. Now, James thus leads us to the conclusion of a, of a compelling argument. That's, I mean, he's given a great argument here. And since God is impartial and the Christian faith is consistent with God's, God's nature, partiality is incompatible with Christianity. So partiality is incompatible with God's plan and purpose for selecting the world's poor to be rich in Christ. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself and be partial. Period. You can't. Strictly speaking, partiality is a sin that completely violates God's law and renders a person a transgressor. And listen, if partiality were your only, were your only transgression, it would be enough to, to send you to a place called hell for all eternity. And if you're brought before God's judgment, He looks at your life and He finds that you have not shown mercy 
and, and he's and, he, and you don't belong to Christ, he's going to show you no mercy because that would prove that you're not saved and you do not possess the life of God. But, I love this but, but God, right? But if, you, if he examines your life and he sees a pattern of mercy toward others and impartiality toward, toward those that are in need, you will triumph over judgment as a result of the life of God in your soul and, and the salvation found in Jesus Christ. That's James's message to us today. And, and that says two things as we close. Number one, examine your life. That's the first thing. Examine your life. Each, each of these that he's given us are a test that he's given so that we can assess the validity of our faith. Examine your life. Is your life characterized by impartiality? Are you concerned with being gracious, with being kind and thoughtful and loving and providing equally for the poor as well as everyone else in your life? That's the issue he's talking about. The second is an exhortation. He's, he's exhorting Christians to ensure that we're living out these principles in the church, outside of the church, all of it by demonstrating our love for one another. If that's the pattern of your life, it shows your faith in Christ and, and the work that he has done in your heart. See, he transforms hearts. It shows that your life, the life of God is present in your soul and, and in your serving of others. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you see things in your life that have violated that, it's time to confess it. It's time to, to confess it, to seek his face, repent of it, seek his forgiveness, and be restored to the place that God desires you to be. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, you look in your own heart and you see the absence of that constant expression of love for, for one another or for others, you should take a closer look at your life. That's what he's saying. Take a closer look, look at your life and see if you truly know Christ. Not in word, but truly know Christ. This is what James is saying. And he calls for us to do that examination. So the question is, is do you know Christ in a real and personal way? Is he your Savior and Lord? Do you pass these tests? If not, we'll give you a chance to get that right. Whether it's confessing it or whether it's coming to him for the first time or whatever it may be. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. James is so straightforward, and James is so clear uh, on what you want from us. And so, Lord, we the only way we can be impartial is because you have come into our life as, as our Savior and Lord, and it's your life that's being lived through us. So, Lord, I just pray for any here, any watching online, if they don't know Jesus in a personal way and they say, you know, that's just not me, it can be if you just choose to receive him as your Savior and Lord. And he's willing and able today to bring you into that right relationship. Whether you've wandered away or whether you've never come, uh, his, his arms are always open wide. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll... That you'll be in this invitation and if someone needs to make a decision for you that they would make that today before it's too late we thank you we praise you and we're going to give you glory for all that you do in jesus name we pray amen, amen.